we're going to talk about a fairly sensitive and difficult topic. We're going to talk about ectopic pregnancies, but we're going to focus on the anatomy of ectopic pregnancies. Um, these are really important because, I uh, say, an ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy that is occurring not where it's supposed to occur in the uterus, but somewhere else. And that is pretty much 100% of the time going to be incompatible with the further development and the life of that embryo or the fetus. And it's also likely to cause the death of the mother. So it's a really important thing for medics to recognize. Um, and the anatomy is a really important contributing factor. And I get to talk about a little bit about embryology as well. So what we'll do is we'll have a little look at what normally happens, the normal anatomy, and then we can talk about uh, the more common forms of ectopic pregnancy because it's not, it's not super rare. So the normal anatomy then, and the normal process is that we have the uterus here, we have the ovary here, and we have the, the fallopian tube or the uterine tube or the oviduct running between the two. So the, the purpose of the ovaries are that these are where the ova are, where the eggs are. And one, in humans, one is released about every month, uh, a single ovum. And that is collected by the fimbriae of the uterine tube and the ovum passes down the uterine tube and along to the uterus. So that uterine tube is a muscular tube, so we have peristalsis, we have a wave of muscular contractions slowly pulling that egg along the tube. It takes a number of days uh, and there are ciliated epitheliums, so there are hairs that can move and move the, um, the egg along. So this is an active process, this isn't just gravity, this is a, a carefully choreographed event. And if fertilization is going to occur, fertilization will normally occur within the uterine tube. So fertilization occurs, the ovum becomes a zygote and a blastocyst, it becomes a ball of cells. And that ball of cells will also pass along the uterine tube into the uterus and it will implant into the endometrium the lining inside the uterus, this magical, amazing uh, tissue that will support that blastocyst. The endometrium is an amazing tissue that uh, grows and thickens every month, waiting for an embryo to pass along to it. And if it doesn't, it shed and regrows and what have you. Um, but what happens here, so when the embryo and its surrounding cells get to the endometrium uh, inside the uterus, that will touch the surface of the uterus and trigger a decidual reaction. It'll trigger the cells of the endometrium to work with the supporting cells around the embryo to form the placenta, to develop a blood supply and other supportive structures that are gonna form those layers that we recognize around the, the chorion, the, 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 uh, the amnia, all that sort of stuff, right? So that's an important idea that the cell, the embryo and its surrounding cells, when they contact the endometrium, they will trigger the cells of the endometrium to develop a blood supply and other support tissues that are gonna supply blood to the embryo and then the fetus as it gets bigger, right? So what does that mean for ectopic pregnancies then? A number of things can happen. Um, Sometimes fertilization occurs and that ball of cells forms and it passes into the uterus but it doesn't implant into the endometrium for whatever reason and it passes through the tract and is lost and um, it's probably never known about and it seems likely this happens far more often than we used to realize. Um, or uh, fertilization can occur in the uterine tube and something physical might obstruct the movement of that ball of cells down to the uterus. So the embryo doesn't get to the uterus, it stays inside the uterine tube. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy uh, that is occurring anywhere outside the uterus. And about between one and 2% of all pregnancies are ectopic pregnancies. So it's somewhat common. And 
if the embryo is going to grow and become, become a fetus and is going to continue to grow, well, the uterus, the uterus has got a really thick muscular wall, which means it is great at expanding to a huge size to hold and support the fetus. And that muscular tube is also great at expelling, <laughs> not the greatest term, expelling the fetus through the birth canal at birth. So it's really important that the pregnancy occurs inside the uterus. If the pregnancy occurs somewhere else, then that growth is likely to rupture tissues and damage tissues, and that's gonna cause pain and other problems. Now, I said that the embryo, when it implants into the uterus, triggers the decidual reaction, which causes uh, the growth of blood vessels and other connective tissues. Uh, connected to structures that will support the embryo and the fetus. The key idea here is blood flow, a development of blood vessels that are going to support the embryo and the fetus. This reaction can happen elsewhere. So in an ectopic pregnancy, the embryo must have implanted into a tissue somewhere and triggered that implantation response, that growth of blood vessels, which means that as the embryo or the fetus grows, if it does then rupture a tissue, it's gonna rupture those blood vessels. So there's gonna be a lot of bleeding and that's why this is so dangerous. It's not just growing inside a tissue it shouldn't grow into, but it's also developing vasculature. So then you've got bleeding internally, which is likely to lead to a lot of blood loss, hypovolemic shock, death and so on. Um, the first signs of an ectopic pregnancy then might be pain. So medics have got to have, you've got to have a low threshold for including this in your differential diagnoses. Women of uh, reproductive age that present with pelvic pain or abdominal pain, ectopic pregnancy has got to be on your list somewhere. Uh, human chorionic, you, know, the, you can do a pregnancy test, human chorionic and antitropin will be released if the embryo is implanted. Of course, if the embryo hasn't implanted, it'll just, it'll either leave the body or it'll get absorbed into the body and you'll never know about it. So it means that in an ectopic pregnancy, the embryo must have implanted, which means it must have developed this vasculature, which has allowed it to grow. And then it has grown to a size where it's starting to cause a problem and then those signs and symptoms tell you what you've got to do next. 95% of all ectopic pregnancies are tubal ectopic pregnancies. That is, they are within the uterine tube or the fallopian tube. Um, it's not always clear why this has occurred. It's likely to be because of some physical obstruction that has obstructed the flow of that ball of cells along the uterine tube to the uterus. Maybe there has been a previous incidence of inflammation, you know, infection, inflammation, pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, maybe there has been surgery, something that's caused uh, adhesions. Maybe there's been some other form of uh, physical change to that tube. So the ball of cells has just got kind of hooked up somewhere. Doesn't flow down to the uterus within that the time period of a few days. So it gets to the point where it's then ready to implant into the uterus, but it's not in the uterus. So it starts implanting into the tissue nearby, which is the uterine tube. Like I say, if it doesn't succeed in implanting, not a problem. If it does succeed in implanting, then you've got a problem. So then you can imagine that inside the uterine tube, that increased vascularization will, will occur and the embryo and the support structures will start to grow and that uterine tube is going to rupture at some point, which is likely to kill the mother. Um, and the embryo or the fetus cannot, cannot survive in that location. It cannot grow in the fallopian tube. It needs to be in the uterus. To save the life of the mother, um, that ectopic pregnancy needs to be removed and this may be done surgically and the fallopian tube may also need to be removed as well, probably. That's a salpingectomy. So the salpinx was a really long trumpet that the ancient Greeks had. And this uterine tube kind of looks like that really long trumpet just curled up a little bit. So any surgery uh, involving the uterine tube can, tends to get called salping something, right? Um, it might be possible to treat this medically and uh, stop the growth, but you know, um, that's the issue at hand. Other 
There are other locations where an ectopic pregnancy could occur. It could occur in the cervix, so the, the ball of cells has almost gone all the way through the uterus and out the other end, uh, and it's implanted into the cervix. Um, and there's not enough room there for the uterus to expand and grow. It needs to be higher up in the uterus. And it is possible for an ectopic pregnancy to occur in the ovary, apparently. But these are all exceedingly rare. The tubal pregnancy is most common. The other form of ectopic pregnancy that's interesting is the abdominal ectopic pregnancy. And this is kind of a difficult one to explain. I'll use the torso model and some cling film, right? The first challenge is to work out what we're talking about here. Uh, I've got my cling film. My cling film is the peritoneum. So the abdominal cavity is lined by a thin serous membrane called the peritoneum. And that peritoneum lines not just the inside of the abdominal walls, but it also runs out and covers over the structures of the gastrointestinal tract, right? But in terms of the pelvis, it's the peritoneum that separates the pelvic organs down there from the abdominal organs up here. So how on earth would an ectopic pregnancy get into the abdominal cavity? And by the abdominal cavity, what I'm talking about here is that if this is the parietal peritoneum lining the wall of the abdomen and the shiny surface that we see of the gastrointestinal tract here, this is the visceral peritoneum. My hand there is in the peritoneal cavity. It's in the greater sac. Um, so how does it get, how would an embryo get in there? Nobody's entirely sure, and it's pretty rare. Here's another model. We're looking down into the pelvis here. There's the uterus. There's an ovary. There's one on either side. The pink tube there is the uterine tube, and these are the ligaments. And if we consider that a, a tubal ectopic pregnancy is the most common location for an ectopic pregnancy to occur, and if you consider that abdominal ectopic pregnancies are a make up about 1% of all ectopic pregnancies, so they're rare. See how the peritoneum lies over the uterine tube. It's thought that maybe an injury to the uterine tube, a, a scar, uh, a lesion, maybe it ruptures, maybe it breaks, maybe there's a change in the tube as a result of the implantation. It's thought that there's some something that causes a defect, a lesion in the uterine tube that then causes that um, embryo to pass through. And now it's on this side of the peritoneum because the peritoneum is led directly on the uterine tube. The embryo is now inside the peritoneal cavity. And once it's inside the, side of the peritoneal cavity, it might attach somewhere nearby. And maybe it'll implant on top of the uterus or onto one of the ligaments around here, or maybe down into the, the pouch of Douglas back there. But of course, once it's in the peritoneal cavity, it could float around. It could pass all the way up to the liver or the spleen and implant up there, or onto the small bowel, or even onto the abdominal wall. Once it's in the peritoneal cavity, it could move around to anywhere, really. Now, if it failed to implant at that point, it would just disappear and you'd never know anything about it. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a probability thing. Only if it implants do you then get continued problems of vascular growth and then growth of the embryo and the fetus and uh, that abdominal ectopic pregnancy. The other concept that students of anatomy might be thinking about is that we can't really see it here, but the peritoneum covers the uterine tube, but actually the, the opening of the uterine tube is through the peritoneum. I can't really demonstrate it on here, but when you see it in the body, in the cadaver, um, the opening of the uterine tube where it covers over the ovary there, that actually opens into this peritoneal cavity. So there is a essentially continuous link between the, the peritoneal cavity through that opening of the uterine tube, through the uterus, through the vagina, and externally. Um, 
normally infection is pre prevented because there's a mucus plug in the cervix. Um, but that there is then a link between the uterine tube and the peritoneal cavity through that opening. But of course, remember I said that the uterine tube is a muscular tube, so there's a wave of peristalsis towards the uterus, and there are cilia that also move that ball of cells, move the embryo towards the uterus. So if fertilization occurred in the uterine tube, it's unlikely that that embryo has gone backwards and then out through that tube into the abdominal cavity. Do you see what I mean? Nobody's entirely sure, but it's, um, there are a few complex ideas and shapes here in terms of peritoneum because that's what the peritoneum's like. It's always like that. An ectopic pregnancy is a pregnancy, an implantation of the embryo into a tissue outside of the uterus so not into the endometrium. It's most likely to occur in the uterine tube, um, but it can occur elsewhere as well, and e even in the peritoneal cavity, which can be very unexpected and very strange, but it's, it's a known thing to happen and something to look out for. Uh, but that's the anatomy of the ectopic pregnancy. It's a, a really important thing to keep in mind when women present with abdominal pain and pelvic pain. Now remember, there are lots of causes of abdominal pain and pelvic pain. It's more likely to be something else. But when somebody presents with abdominal pain or pelvic pain, you're gonna have a list of differential diagnoses and ectopic pregnancy should be one of them, if appropriate. Okay, I hope that was useful. Uh, see you next week. <laughs>